so much for attending our fifth and final PL for the week. Um, a lot of you have come to each and every single one of them, and we want to say thank you so much. We've met a lot of you through this, and it's been great. Um, hope everyone had a great Earth Week and an Earth great Earth Day yesterday, and we continue to celebrate and cherish our lovely home that is Earth. Um, I want to take this time to introduce my colleague Joy here, who we've also been seeing all week, and she will be putting the link. So if any of your colleagues are joining, or if you haven't done it already, please, 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 if you sign in for CTLE credit, you have to sign in, and you have to sign out. If you do not do both, we will not be able to give you credit. Just want to say that one more time. Please sign in. Please sign out. We will have the link in the chat, and we'll have it. Joy had it on the screen as well. You have to sign in and sign out. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Hannah ja Jarris and Elaine Blanc from New York Sunworks. They will be facilitating today's PL around energy. Um, and enjoy. Take it away. All right. I'll stop sharing my screen and pass it off to Hannah and Elaine. Thanks so much. Thanks, Joy. Thanks, Nichelle. Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah. I'm Elaine. We're so glad you're able to join us today. We're really excited to talk to you all about um, the energy and resources that go into our food production system. And just a little bit of background. We're going to go more into who we are. We're both from New York Sunworks. We're a nonprofit that builds hydroponic science labs in K through 12 schools across the city. Some of you might be familiar with our labs. This is a picture of our labs. We're gonna talk about what our labs look like and what it is we do uh, later on towards the end of our time together. But the first thing before we all get comfortable in front of our computer screens, if everybody could stand up, stretch their legs, take two minutes, and go and find one to three pieces of fruit or vegetables that you have around you and make a list of, of what you have. Uh, where, what is it? And where did it come from? And if you're not, you can look at the produce stickers to help figure out where it came from. And then we're all gonna gather back and, and see what sort of fruits and vegetables uh, we have at home. See you in a bit. Have fun out there <laughs> in that fridge drawer. Sorry, I, I didn't realize, I forgot that if I should have shared my screen right right then, but I feel like you got it handled until now, until after the yeah. message. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, um, I forgot my banana, it's in the other room. <laughs> Go get it, I got okay, you, I got you. <laughs> everybody. And as you start to come back, if you could go ahead and just drop into the Zoom chat um, what it is you found. Did you already say this, Elaine? I just, I, I didn't say it. I just put it in the chat. Oh, Everybody's writing apple and banana. I've got apple. Whoa, someone's got a whole spread. Love it. All the Ooh, veggies. Great. So yeah, as you come back, uh, drop in what you, what you have at home and, and uh, you can go ahead and put it in, put in what you, where it's from, if we know it. Yeah, or, yeah just at least examine the examine the evidence try to figure out where it is where you think okay we got some people getting all right mm. mangoes on a warm day love that mm -hmm. oh such a nice selection of things this, this is, is great, great. Mm -hmm. oh i like zucchini too Wow, okay. So let me just take a quick scroll through. Looks like people are coming back. Um, so if everybody could um, 
on the screen. If everybody could go to menti.com and you can do this on your phone or you can do this on your browser. Um, if you go to menti.com and enter the code that you see as um, on the slide, I'm gonna stop. Does everybody have that code? I'll also put it into the chat. Let's visualize some of this information that we're all gathering. All right. Yeah, and all these locations, some people seem to have questions like a question mark. Don't worry. Yeah, general general areas or regions are great. Yeah, as long as you know they're like in this country, maybe a different state, things like that. You're you're great. Or as we speak, gleaning. Oh, there, Hannah's going to show you. We're gleaning that info. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Make this nice and big. All right. So everyone keep on dropping in information about where your fruits and our vegetables came from. You should have the option to put in um, more than one thing. If you had, for the people who are listing, multiple pieces of fruit and vegetables. So we're seeing a lot are coming from a different state, a different country. Um, for those people that are putting in other, um, I'd be curious to uh, hear what that is. And if it's like an, I don't know, that's great too different state, different country. Some things are coming from within New York state. We've got some farmer market purchasers, right? Great. All right, so feel free to keep dropping things into the to the poll if, if you'd like, but we're gonna keep on moving right along. And all of this is to say is that when we, when we at New York Sunworks are talking about food production and the resources and energy that go into it, one of the conversations we like to have our students think about is where does our food, in this case, fruit and vegetables coming from? And we can see it's coming from sometimes within the state, but sometimes really far, sometimes coming from a different country. So, where our food is coming from is one part as we talk about energy and resources in the food production cycle. The second part is going to be about how the food is produced. And there are a lot of different ways that we grow food. I'm sure you're familiar with, with many of them, but we're gonna walk quickly walk through some of those um, different uh, ways. So Elaine, are you going yeah, to- Yeah, I'm, I'm on it. Perfect. On it. Perfect, perfect, perfect. You can find it. Where are you? There you are. Sorry. Um, one thing that I think is so valuable about as I'm as I'm navigating this whole Zoom life, um, <laughs> that's so valuable about that sticker or veggie activity is how how much energy you know, each one of those brackets that Hannah had separated is filled with or is consuming, right? And how impactful um, those each bracket can be. It's really, it's really profound. Oh, say sorry. There we go. Take it away, Hannah. Thank oh, you. No. There we go. So we, um, the first, the first one. way of producing, of how we grow our food um, is going to be, we're going to start outside. And the first way is um, small organic farms, right? So some of our produce is going to come from small organic farms and they're committed to growing food with traditional indigenous methods. Um, they're going to be using, um, most, most likely using incorporating crop rotation or other mes me methods to ensure soil integrity. Um, probably not, or probably not, they won't be using chemical fertilizers. This type of farming is going to be more labor intensive, but then there's also ways we can talk about efficiency within current farming methods. And so here we're going to be more um, using water systems more efficiently like drip irrigation and um, 
So that's one way, current uh, small organic farms. And then we also have um, small gardens that can be a source of produce, right? And then after small gardens, we have industrial farming. And I'm sure that many of us are familiar with industrial farming and what it looks like. And the average consumer in the US is part of this industrial farm supply chain where large farms are going to be producing massive crop yields and sell that those large yields um, to, to, to large food distributors. Um, and fun fact, industrial farming is responsible for producing almost 80% of the world's food. Um, so we know that many people on this call are probably familiar with industrial farming, but we wanted to just show a quick video um, because of the pros and cons of industrial agriculture. And so as you're watching this video, it would be helpful to just drop into the chat if there are new things that you're hearing or learning for the first time. Um, and we'll let the video speak for itself. Anna, you might have to share the audio with us. There's no audio. Oh, okay. It's um, on the, if you go to the uh, little mic, it says audio setting and you can share computer audio. Th there is no audio. Oh, 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 oh. it doesn't have any audio. Sorry, my bad. It's okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so did anybody learn anything or hear anything new about a pro or con of the industrial agriculture system? Maybe something that surprised them or they hadn't thought about before? You can drop it into the chat or, or come off mute. I'm constantly surprised about how 80% of our world's food is, is produced by industry and, but it's mind blowing to me that that like is making, right? Like uh, world hunger and things like this, like much less of a, an issue in, in all over the world. It, it's incredible how many people we're able to feed now uh, through this method. Yeah, exactly. And um, you no, know, you can go to the next slide for sure. Just you know, Pamela, thanks for, I mean, thanks everybody for contributing in the chat. And Pamela, you, I agree. I often forget the technology makes the work easier, less backbreaking. And at New York Sunworks, when we talk about food production, we also are going to talk about the intersection between humans, the environment and technology, because what we do is we put bring hard hydroponic farming to classrooms across the city. And so hydroponic farming also happens at an industrial or commercial level. And so these are some pictures of what that looks like. Massive heads of lettuce growing in these uh, industrial size nutrient film techniques. And then we can look at some examples. Gotham Green, so this is an example of a, of a giant commercial size rooftop greenhouse run by Gotham Greens. It's in Brooklyn. Again, you can see the scale at which they're able to produce uh, lettuces and leafy greens. Arrow Farms is another example. So uh, they, are, they are leaders in the vertical commercial uh, uh, hydroponic farming. So th these are, they have warehouses in New Jersey that are just floor to ceiling of these vertical hydroponic systems, again, where they're growing leafy greens and lettuces at massive scale. 
And then uh, we're gonna again talk in detail at the end about New York Sunworks, but we also produce, we also make it possible to produce food directly in our classrooms. And so we do that through a number of different hydroponic systems, but also through aquaponics. And then there's just one more picture of another angle. Again, you can see where in our classrooms, we're growing kale and lettuce and herbs, and then in the vine crop systems, cucumbers and tomatoes and um, those fruits that we love to eat. So I'm gonna pass it off to Elaine, but just end with saying that we like to, with our students, take a big picture approach of where is our food coming from and how is it produced. And then this, what we're gonna, the activity we're all gonna engage with today um, was something that came out of the need for us to think about how we take the learning that wasn't possible in our classrooms over the past year because of COVID and how do we still have, create a way and a space for students to in, engage in these important conversations. So Elaine, take it away. Thanks, Anna. You know, I find one of the biggest things about like when we are bringing up industrial scale agriculture or, um, you know, growing locally, um, you know, students, I think, really naturally see like maybe the nutrition value or sort of the local economy uh, benefits of purchasing locally and, and growing. But I think energy and resource use and energy footprints are so big it's sometimes hard to communicate um, that and 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 without students like working with a hydroponic system we were like as hannah said how can we use uh this digital you know medium to create a space where we're not just you know watching videos engaging which you know is is definitely our bread and butter but how do we get them to work with the material and so um, one thing we thought was creating this digital food map activity where students are wrestling with the idea of food production and all the energy and resources that go into those steps of that, of that you know, intensely amazing and beautiful dance of, of resource use to create these amazing opportunities for us. Um, you know, I think Hannah and I were just talking uh, when we were going through this and I, it still occurs to me when I see this slide is like, think about a hundred years ago, how many times you would eat chocolate in your lifetime versus versus now, or maybe it was like 150, but whatever. But like, you know, it, how far we've come where now we can just like go to the grocery store and pick from like 50 different types of chocolate, right? Um, it's crazy. Uh, so um, to keep this within like a half an hour, 20, 15 minute presentation, we had to pick the most simple chocolate bar, but can you imagine like, you know, you're gonna get your joy or like, you know, almond joy, it's gonna have like a lot more complicated, not only these ingredients, but then like coconut and other more sugars and all sorts of things. But so keeping it simple, we picked like a regular, you know, clearly Hershey's bar, but we're not endorsing Hershey's here, but you know, it's just a simpler, simpler kind of bar um, at your corner store. And then as we saw earlier, right, that most of this food comes from Farm. So how do we get from like, you know, this picturesque uh, farm of, you know, hay or something and sunlight and air and water and all our abiotic factors to uh, something that we buy for, you know, when I was growing up 50 cents, now it's probably like closer to a dollar for a chocolate bar. Like, what are we going to do, you know? So this is uh, our method that we chose to, to dive into. This is kind of laying it out chunk by chunk. So first off, one of the things that we always take advantage or take advantage of, take for granted is the uh, distribution fa factor of food, right? Um, being a New York City person, right? Us being in the city, you see that a lot more, you know, you're definitely faced with trucks or stuck behind trucks or moving around. And it's a little bit more in your face than say these uh, sort of more um, spread out environments where they have back doors for folks and you don't really see the like, you know, all the, all the boxes. So maybe we live in a, that's one thing that I love being about an urban, in an urban person is, uh, you know, a lot of things that you kind of, that you might not interact with. You can't avoid everything, everything that's around you, you know, so you interact with these spaces a lot more, but right there, there are large, large distribution is a large part of food uh, production, right? We have lots of energy and this is clearly the most energy, um, 
dense and largest ecological footprint um, in terms of getting food to us, right? Uh, Hershey factory, say is in Pennsylvania, maybe there's one in New Jersey, it gets on a truck, it's got to go to a place where it's then reboxed and resent out to the stores, specific stores through specific truck companies or uh, distribution companies like Cisco or, you know, Utz or whoever delivers to that corner store and then and then your, your corner bodega with your with your chocolate bar. So, and that's just the last bit, right? We got to get to the chocolate bar that's sitting at the Hershey factory. So let's let's take a dive into that. So everything's made with commodities. We have our basic foods that are grown on those farms that, that Hannah walked us through, or even maybe we could imagine in a dream world that our hot chocolate bar was grown on a small organic farm somewhere, that'd be great too. Um, but they all start with commodities, right? These basic, basic um, ingredients or, um, uh, what's the word, harvest. Um, and so these basic harvests that we create and produce that we create and then end up having having to modify to turn into the chocolate bar. So um, one thing that really is, I think, so important when you're talking about commodities and, and production and food production and um, is that trying to, tr for some reason, there's the, I mean, for some reason, historically, a lot of these uh, commodities are, you know, rooted in slavery and there can be, there's these like negative uh, narratives, like my sugar is grown, uh, you know, by some mammy in like Jamaica or whatever. And it's so important that we, that we break that narrative, you know, like, take those take those uh yeah take those stories these like that are no longer true and destructive and like cut those down right and i think that is one of the biggest um powerful pieces of of ecological and 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 like in studies is that like we're we're taking you know these facades and really bearing that like the earth is our mother and we're all on this earth and we're all dependent on on our earth for food and sustenance and energy and all the things. So, right, Brazil and China are our main sugar cane exporters, Ghana, Indonesia, African, African nations are our main cocoa exporters. Um, and then we have soy is locally, we're actually US is the biggest soy exporter. We're a soy, we're a soy country, we grow lots of soy here. And then milk is often produced um, in, within the nation or even in some countries it's, it's uh, it's traditionally grown within the neighborhood. They'll have their own like dairy in like, they'll have like a New York City dairy in like different countries. So, so let's see how this looks on a, the beginning of a food map. So here we are, we have, as always, all energy is harnessed by the sun through the process of photosynthesis, right? We take that plants are magnificent base of all energy on our on life, whether it's oil or, you know, all the things, natural gas, all comes from plants that have decomposed and we've harnessed the carbon. And but in this case, we're talking about energy for us in this particular case, right? It's to harvest, we, the plants harvest that sunlight, uh, turn it into viable sugar, whether it's, or in proteins, whether it's soy, sugar cane, right? The castor beans, these are all the ingredients that went into our delicious chocolate bar and then um, co cacao from our farm that needs to be processed into chocolate. And then all the energy that goes into each one of these arrows, right? So every arrow represents energy use and um, whether it's human energy or uh, to process and factory energy. So we're using oil, we're using electricity, we're using, I mean, and obviously I'm going through this quickly. This is a whole lesson that you would be doing with your students. They could definitely participate in these pieces. Um, but just thinking about the energy that goes into making just something as simple as like milk fat, right? <laughs> it's, it's wild. All right. Um, as we create our commodity, our basic commodity out of our, um, into a basic food like sugar, then it needs to distribution and transportation. Here we go. So much energy goes into that as well, um, as always. And then once we're there, say it's all, it's on a cargo ship, it gets to a truck, and then we're all finally at the Hershey factory where we synthesize, make that, make that chocolate bar, get it on a truck, 
get it to the distribution center, get it off the truck, repackage it, get back on the truck and get to a corner store. It's a lot of energy for one chocolate bar. Um, I'm exhausted just talking about it, let alone making it. Um, so, right, so this is obviously way more complicated than you would want a student to make. And, um, but it's just to give them a concept of like, just to touch on, right? And this is a, and this is even a simple bar, right? Like imagine like a bag of chips where you have that lot of those like lines and lines of ingredients, you know? And so um, something for them to think about. Um, and so the, as this, using this as an example, we have created and are excited to share with you an opportunity to create your own. Uh, so as a student might, or as you might with your class. Um, and kind of what we decided to do, and I think it's an interesting concept. And what we really, let me, let me take a step back, is that one thing that at New York Summers, which we really think is an opportunity um, with the virtual and distance learning um, is that we can do a lot of like um, differentiation and with the same content and really have students um, dive into the, the concepts and in, in the way that they feel comfortable, right? A student might not feel comfortable going to table A in the class with more, who needs more assistance. Like if you need me, come over here, right? But if you give them op virtual options in terms of like, choose your own challenge, they, it, that feels good to you. They, you know, in a virtual realm, they might feel more inclined to do something that feels appropriate for them um, without all their peers around them or might, they might be okay with taking a little extra longer, whatever the differentiation is in that situation. But um, so we really, um, yeah, that's one piece that we're really excited about. And when we were trying to think of uh, how to present this, we thought that it could be a cool opportunity where we are gonna be as a, in small groups making these food maps in a very simple way. But these food maps are very, they're just, it's just lettuce, right? Lettuce, but we decided if we all do a lettuce that's grown in a different type of way, right? Which is a simple activity, but then when we compile those and compare them, then we're starting to build, right? And scaffold that information. And then we can do a, a compare and contrast and use it as data. And we can talk about, we can even, if we were say we're doing this with a high school lesson, maybe, well, I'll let you decide what we're, how valuable it is. I'm not gonna give it all away. So I think Hannah, you're gonna is gonna share the link um, and then joy you're gonna split folks up all right so i think we're just gonna dive in you're gonna find your corresponding breakout room number right is that right yeah. yeah yeah so will you just go to the next slide elaine just so people can give people a snapshot before they hop into no yes of course yeah so um you i just put a link into the chat for uh, a set of Google Slides. Each set of slides has a group number on it. So when we're put into our groups, go ahead and just work on the slides that have your group's number on it. But yeah, Elaine, why don't you demonstrate? Um, so I'm just gonna pick in, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I think it's hard for me to demonstrate while I'm pre in presenting mode, unfortunately. Um, but what you're gonna do ideally is you're going to, I'm just going to stop sharing here. Hold on one second. Um, here, I can share while you talk through it. Yeah. Um, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. So you're going to, you're going to be working with the, uh, with the slide in, in a editing mode, right? And you're going to just go ahead and drag and click uh, a drop and use the arrows to represent energy use. Um, or transformation of a product. And then you're gonna use the orange uh, boxes for the ingredient and the location, the best you can judge or the, so with lettuce, we're not gonna be going through any like sort of modification of the ingredients. And, that, and definitely when you're using this activity with students, <clears throat> simpler, the better. Um, modifications or, you know, synthesizing or creating or, or you know, uh, the fusion of ingredients or commodities is, is really complicated for folks. And as you get up to the high school level, then maybe that, that does feel appropriate. It's up to you. Um, but 
uh, just being maybe for the first round, just keeping it as so it's always going to stay lettuce, just um, at different stages. And you can talk about the energy and resource use um, in those that are encompassed in those arrows. So you'll use those arrows to um, to show energy use or or distribution. And then the the green will be uh, the mode of transportation, as said. So I'm just going to create something similar uh, to the large complex map, but maybe just like one row of what we saw um, in that large, large food map. Um, exactly. And then in the box above your workspace, it'll say where your origin, where the lettuce is starting from. So keep in mind when you start making your maps. Yes, and I think the choices will be, you know, lettuce grown, um, at a local farm in New York State from the farmer's market or lettuce that's maybe grown in California from the supermarket, which is, you know, 80% of what lettuce you're going to find in the supermarkets grown in California. So you'll, you'll see what it says, but I have to give you a heads up. All right. Great. I think I'm going to kick people out to breakout rooms. You'll see you'll be in room one, two, three, or four. And um, we'll be joining you there in a minute. Welcome back, everyone. Joy, I had a class, so that's why I joined late. No problem, Marion. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Okay. All right. You're We're welcome. happy to have you. Okay. All right. Everybody's back. Great. Oh, Elaine, you're on mute. I'm on mute. Sorry, everybody. I, we were having such great conversation in our in our breakout. I wanted to like write down the last few things we had said. Sorry, I really want to take notes. Um, so, what are the big takeaways? What What were some of the things that surprised you, either about the conversation or, um, it, let alone like compare? We can talk about comparing in just a minute. But, um, what were some of the big takeaways in terms of conversation that were like aha moments, maybe for you or or, or just things that you enjoyed? You know, there seemed to be a lot of steps to bring lettuce to uh, its location. Mm -hmm. right. Even lettuce can be complicated, right? We have a, a I, comment. I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I found that especially uh, group three that had the industrial farm um, I, I forgot how it, uh, one of our colleagues said that it took more energy in transportation than it did in actually the energy that you get from the lettuce as a nutritional substance. I thought that was amazing. Absolutely. And, Mind blowing. No, go ahead. Keep going. Um, go ahead. Okay, I did enjoy doing the food map because um, right now I taught my kids about food waste today and in the, our outdoor garden, we're learning where do food, our food come from, that's our team. So doing the food map, even though I came on late, was really exciting for me because that's something that I will do in my classroom with my fifth graders too, since we have the conversation of where does our food come from and um, why is it better to grow our foods locally when we can? So. It would be cool, Marion, to compare like a lettuce from the garden to mm -hmm. one in a supermarket and have like the maps and kind of see the difference between the two. Yes, thank you. I will. Um, and one of the conversations we had is that when um, I grew cantaloupes in the summer in the garden, and what I noticed that the cantaloupe that I grew in the garden, after two weeks, I cut it, I had it in the refrigerator, and it didn't spoil. But the ones that I usually buy in the store, after about what three days it starts to go bad so that's one of the conversations we have is it better to grow our food locally or to have it to purchase it from the supermarket? right because the soup because you have to think about the fact that when you cut it 
it has a is able to live its whole life with you versus when it's taken from somewhere else it has to spend probably like half of its life getting transported to you and then the other little bit is left with you and therefore that's why it spoils so quickly uh, I mean, I'm mind blown thinking about that myself. Like, oh, that's why my spinach only lasts like two days, you know. <laughs> and and the taste. It's been it living. Tastes. It's been living in a trunk for like a whole week <laughs> before it got to me. <laughs> and the taste. The next time, the right. taste is so different. Mm. Awesome. Right. Ah, such good work. Um. So yeah, the and then. And then the next question is power and comparing the different food maps. How did that feel? Um, did that change, you know, the conversations about around the food map and the intricacies and the intensity, the intensivity, that's not a real word, but I'm coining it right now, the intensivity of, of our food production right now um, versus just comparing the different food maps and how intensive certain ones are versus, versus others. Was that did, was that insightful for folks or yeah, what do you see? Um, Elaine and, and Hannah, one of the questions that, that we talked about was the artificial lighting needing energy itself. So um, can we, for instance, so instead of using um, electricity that's being produced by fossil fuels, which is what we use in New York City um, through the steam uh, propulsions, what uh, would is um, Sunworks considering with solar panels or alternative energy sources to run these artificial uh, systems? It's a great question. And Sunworks is always thinking about how we can be more sustainable in what we do. Right now, in order to connect our system to solar panels, the school buildings themselves would have to be equipped to support solar panels. So something that we're thinking about, it's not, we, don't, we don't do it yet, but I will say that what we do do is that we use the most energy efficient light bulbs as possible in our systems right now. So it's not the best, we can always do better, but we're actively thinking and experimenting and staying up to date on what's happening in that space. So great question. Right, because the challenge is finding wiring to capabilities in our old school buildings putting in wiring for that and all the permits it needed for that. I, I can imagine, I don't actually have those conversations. Hannah's a little bit more facing that side of realms than I am, but I can imagine those conversations being very long and, and years, years, talking years, right? So sorry, Hannah, go ahead. No, no, and we'll, I'll show you some pictures because our rooftop greenhouses, they largely depend on sunlight because they're, they're glass. So we'll sh I'll show you those, those two. And the artificial lighting, um, is it traditional or you switched over to LED, which is more efficient and reduces the heat amount? Because that's another thing that when we started our greenhouses and our hydroponics in our school, um, the amount of heat that was being generated. So we needed to ventilate the air yeah. and we'll make sure that we had windows and doors. Yeah, we do use LED light bulbs across all of our systems. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Anna, I just wanted to add, in our office, we've installed solar panels on 49 school buildings and we right. have almost 200 in the pipeline. So if you are curious if your school is solar ready, we can connect you with Christine, who's our solar program manager, who looks at roof age, and that is happening on New York City schools. I'm pretty excited. Yeah, that, I'm that's ready. so exciting. Yeah, definitely. I'm definitely. ready. I, we fought for our rooftop garden and we actually, uh, before even construction started, we protested and to the point where we got our council people and our community boards to come in and back us up and they had to redraw the entire school plan to make sure that we had a roof access and uh, that's where we have our garden. So. Mm. That, yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so I feel like we're, we're, we're wrapped. So I'm just going to pass the, the ball to Hannah and I'm going to share my screen again. Hold on one sec. Um, so we, I, there's been so much that's already been shared. We just like to capture um, from everybody, if possible, what 
you think why it's important to do the, this kind of food mapping activity and how do you see yourself using it in your in your class and um, we're going to go back to the to the mentimeter board and we can we'll share these results out with you with everybody later but um, i'm putting the link again into the into the chat um, if you could click on that and then we're, we're, we're going to transition to talk about more about new york sunworks um, but if you could answer that question uh, through mentimeter that would be really wonderful i'll also put the the code back in the chat if you're um, entering your answers through a device that isn't your computer. Um, and then I will actually share my screen briefly so that we can together take a look at some of those answers as they, as they come in. Yeah. Right, and that's something that we have heard from teachers who have been using this activity this year is it really does open students' minds. They're asking lots of questions about it. Um, can be used across multiple subjects. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I'm going to um, let you all keep putting in your answers to those questions. And now I'm gonna just switch gears a little bit and tell you about New York Sunworks because we do grow, um, we do grow fresh pr produce in our classrooms that, that students get to, get to eat. All right, so um, thanks Elaine. So our mission at New York Sunworks is, is I've already, we've already mentioned a bunch. We build innovative uh, hydroponic science labs in K through 12 schools across New York City. And we're actually in New Jersey now. Um, and our goal is to use hydroponic technology and urban agriculture as a lens to talk about topics in sustainability science. New York Sunworks, we were founded in 2004. Our first lab was actually on, it was floating. It was on the science barge built in 2007. Our first rooftop greenhouse classroom was built in 2010. And since then, we've been developing teacher training workshops. We've been building out our K through 12 curriculum. Um, we've been building more greenhouse classrooms across the city. And now we're actually in over 140, we've built over 140 greenhouse classrooms across New York City. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so this is what one of our classrooms looks like. We, I already talked a little bit about the different systems, but for a quick review, the vine crop system is where we're gonna be growing our fruiting crops, tomatoes, cucumbers, and eggplants, peas, beans. The NFT is where we're gonna be growing leafy greens. So lettuces, kales. Also, we're gonna grow herbs like basil and cilantro. The tower garden is also where we're gonna be growing leafy greens and herbs. All of our classrooms also come with a, a compost, a worm composting bin so that any sort of, any of the, the scraps that will come on harvest days or pruning days won't go into the normal trash. They'll be redirected into our compost bins. And what you'll notice too, is that all of our systems, so when we talk about hydroponic farming, we're talking about growing plants without soil. So we're using nutrient filled water and that lives in a reservoir that sits below each system. The reservoir, for the, the reservoir for the tower garden is right here. And then through, a pow, through electricity, all the systems are plugged in. We're gonna use energy to pump the water from the reservoir up to the various channels or buckets, and then it's going to flow down. So this is actually at a, uh, a, a, an angle. It'll flow down and flow across the plant roots. The extra water will drain back into the reservoir and then the water will be recycled throughout. All of you'll see the lights, right? We know that there, we need lights for these systems to work. The lights and the pumps are on timers. So the plants are getting the water and nutrients and light, the amount that they need, but only for a certain amount of time. For, so only for as long as they need it. And then we also have fans in the classroom to help with air circulation and uh, pollination for our vine crops. Next slide, please. This is just another example. These are classrooms. They are learning spaces. We want students to be at the center of the action. So of course, we're gonna put desks and, and chairs in there as well. And this, you'll see the three systems, the tower gardens. The three systems are also found in our rooftop greenhouses. So we have the vine crop systems, the NFT, the tower garden, um, except here on our rooftops, the, uh, the light the plants need is going to be coming largely from the sun, so they're, they're glass, 
that these greenhouses are uh, enclosed in glass. Our rooftops also have rainwater catchment systems. So we're gonna catch and filter rainwater and that's gonna be uh, water that we're gonna use in the hydroponic systems. And then we also do aquaponics. Um, so that's the aquaponics take. We really are focused on sustainability through this lens of urban agriculture. So I already talked about the rainwater catchment system and the worm composting bins. If there are pests in the classroom, which just happens with uh, farming, we are going to use something called integrated pest management. So we don't use fertilizers. Instead, if aphids become a problem, for example, we'll introduce ladybugs, which are a natural predator of aphids, and they'll munch and munch and munch and take care of that aphid problem. We also, some of our classrooms come with um, energy bike stations, which is a, a way for students to get on a bike and see how much of their energy it takes to power a series of light bulbs. Sometimes you, you can also take that energy and power a little blender and make pesto from the basil that students are growing in their classrooms. So that's a fun activity. We put all of our students, we call them farmer scientists at the center of the action. So they are the ones that are helping to clean and care for the systems. They're the ones that are monitoring the water quality to make sure that the plants they're growing are getting the nutrients that they need to grow big and strong and thrive. They're the ones who are helping monitor the composting bins and making sure the worms are happy. They're harvesting um, everything from lettuces, like look at those roots, amazing, to shard, peppers, um, and I think, well, this, this uh, student over here actually has a spray bottle in her hand and they are, um, in addition to ladybugs, for example, we also have recipes for students to make um, non-toxic sprays to help control pests. So they, students are involved all the way through from seed to harvest. <clears throat> And so when a school partners with New York Sunworks, we like to break it down into three buckets. We build, we teach, and we connect. And so when we say we build, um, we can go to the next slide. The other members of our team will actually work with the school to lay out, to work with your existing classroom space or rooftop space and help uh, design the layout for a hydroponics lab. When we say we teach, we have, um, our K through 12 Discovering Sustainability Science curriculum that all of our partner schools have access to. <clears throat> In addition to that, we also have um, on-site curriculum mentoring support and professional learning sessions throughout the school year. On the technical side, we have a greenhouse support team that will train new teachers in how to care for the systems and uh, plant crops. And they will also take weekly visits to your classrooms to make sure that everything is running efficiently and smoothly as it should be. And then the third thing that we, this third bucket is all about connection. And so we want what happens in the hydroponic labs to be connected to the school community and then to families. So we help our partners have uh, design and run harvest festivals for their school to have, to bring sustainability campaigns throughout the school we also sometimes will connect schools with other partners that might be a food bank to use uh, where we'll donate what's grown in your lab to that food bank. Also, we find that open houses are really popular for things like parent teacher conferences and STEM nights. And then <clears throat> probably one of my favorite things about this connect bucket is our youth conference. At the end of every school year, the youth conference, Discovering Sustainability Science Youth Conference is an opportunity for students in our um, who are, have been doing work in their labs to come together and present their research or sustainability projects. It's a really supportive and empowering event for our students and it celebrates all of the hard work that they've done but all the hard work that our teachers have done. And so we would love to stay connected with you all. Thank you so much for, for joining. Um, today's session. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We also have a YouTube channel. And then finally, if you're interested in seeing what we're up to on a more regular or on a, in a more detailed format, you can send an email to info at newyorksunworks.org to join our newsletter. And then um, with that, the final slide has uh, my email address on there and Elaine's email address on there. So if after this you have questions about the activity we did today or the things we talked about today, don't hesitate to reach out. And um, that's what we have. We'll pause and see if there's any remaining questions or comments. I can pull up the, the Mentimeter board too, if that's of interest.
questions for Hannah and Elaine? You can email them too, but you can help someone else right now if you have any questions. You can put it in the chat as well. We'll read it out. Yeah. Um, hi, Hannah. Hello. Thank you for all your conference. I, I was, my question is uh, that that's, uh, New Year's Song Works offer uh, any kind of technical help uh, to public school gardens or uh, public school um, hydroponic labs in the city, like any kind of like for to solve technical issues or something like that? That's like okay. questions in general. Yeah. If you have existing hydroponic technology in your labs? Yes. Yes. Um, I think that we have done that on a one-off basis. You, you can, why don't you follow up with me in an email and we'll see, we'll see we, what we can do. Typically our curriculum and our, our the train, the technical, the in-depth technical training that we offer is for our partner teachers, but um, shoot me an email. All right. Thank you so much. Of course. Any other other question? Question? <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, Elaine and Hannah, um, this is related to what you guys were presenting earlier when talking about the different types of farming, because um, I always get really bogged down by the label organic, and it's really hard to navigate like all the different definitions of what organic means. And because even if you tell people to buy organic, like it, is it really organic? And I guess I've always struggled personally, so I don't also know how to explain that to students <laughs> or how to help them navigate that world no it's a it's a huge one and actually our, our high school curriculum has a whole lesson based around it because the organics it, you can buy organics at whole foods but if it's grown in in china or grown in indonesia is that more sustainable like that's a question i don't i i, I don't have that answer you know but that's definitely a conversation to have and i think um i think one thing that i, I i'm not sure pamela which which grade level you're working with at the moment but um, I think being just really transparent about that conversation and saying, hey, this is really what's going on. And like in a dream world, you know, you could go out to your strawberry patch and eat a strawberry without getting chemical burns on your face. But some places that's not the case, you know, and, and that's really, I think, the mission behind organics, right, um, was to like, you know, make it chemically free. But then, you know, when we translate organic to a industrial scale, it gets way more complicated. Um, and I think, and I think that's where, that's where you have to, you know, make those decisions, decisions on your own and, and, and cost effects. Yeah. And benefit effects, I guess would be a better way to say it. Um, if I may, one of the things, Pamela, I, I don't know, but the USDA has a certain definition for what organic is. And there are certain things that can be called organic. And there are some companies that actually are taking advantage of it and calling some of the products organic when they're not. So that's a, that's a good one for students to investigate. Go to the USDA, find out what their definition is, what it is that says is organic. Because as Elaine said and Hans said, if it is being organic in a different country might have different definitions uh, according to their regulations. That is a great idea. Doing an investigation on that word. That's awesome. I'm an ELA teacher too. So that's just like perfect. Exactly. <laughs> that's great. And I'm middle school, by the way. So I think telling them the truth and being honest is perfect. And then just having them do the, the work themselves is that's good. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. And I just, I just saw what Joy put in the, the chat, the discussion guide for the movie Food Inc. Yeah, that's a, it's a great resource too. Any other questions, comments, thoughts on this Friday afternoon? I just want to pull up what everyone has seen so many times and first say thank you so much, Hannah and Elaine, for yep. giving us your time and expertise, sharing a really translatable workshop and worksheet to our educators that they could take and use next week with their students in all different grade levels. We really appreciate you. And you both made this Earth Week a success. And then 
to our attendees, who we all appreciate so much, please make sure you take a few minutes to sign out for CTLE credits. So either tinyurl.com slash sus to sign out or the link that I have put in the chat. Um, again, so appreciative for New York Sunworks, Hannah and Elaine, such a really captivating, really good, yeah. wonderful presentation. Thanks for including us and thanks everybody for joining in today. It's been, it's been fun. I'm going to appreciate my food a little bit more when I'm eating it. <laughs> All the energy it took to get here. <laughs> yeah, happy birthday, everybody. And let's keep doing yeah. the good work. Yep. Y'all are here because you are doing the good work. So yep. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just like Joyce said, if you can please sign out for your CTLE credit, if that's what you came for. Also, we'll be sending out the resources immediately after. Uh, so you should, it should be in your mailbox at around 3 o'clock. In that email will be a survey. As many of you know, please take literally three minutes to complete it. The survey helps us make these trainings much more engaging and fun and you know, use, useful for all of you. Um, and thank you. Thank you all for, you know, hanging out with us this whole week. It's been fun. We, like I said before, we met a lot of people. We met Jonathan's new baby. And next time we see him, he'll probably be one. Um, but hopefully we'll see him before then. And thank you all. Thank you all. Check out our resource portal. Yep. We'll put that in the chat as well. We have some great professional learnings coming up at the end of April and then early May. Sarah Slack, uh, an educator from, from yesterday's professional learning, is leading a session on urban heat islands and how students can collect real-time data about surface area temperatures and use that data to uh, inform a larger scientific conversation around climate change. So that's on May 6th. On May 7th, we have student engagement events, so uh, especially for elementary school and then a separate event for middle and high school. Sign up, bring your green team, bring your classes. We'd love to have you. And if you're not your school's sustainability coordinator, that is our main channel to you. So if you're interested, reach out and I'll try and sell it as best as I can. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty fun role and uh, you get to hang out with Michelle and I a lot and we're here to with you. Um, in that journey to sustainability in your school. And last but not least, we'll be having our showcase again this year, which will be in June. So look out soon for a save the date, a time. It'll be virtual. Many of you who've attended in person know how fun it is. We're trying to make it equally as fun virtually. Um, so we hope you can attend. Yeah, save the date.